Hi, thanks for watching Cryptid Cryptids Research and Investigation. Today is Saturday, June 6, 2020, and on this episode, I'm going to go over my trip to Obsidian Butte by the Salton Sea. I went on May 16, 2020, and it's all part of the continuation of my Salton Sea explorations. So Obsidian Butte is located at the south end of the current shoreline, and it's an important location both for geological and archaeological reasons. The Salton Buttes are five lava domes at the south end of the sea, and there has been a lot of research done on trying to determine the age of creation of Obsidian Butte. The um, obsidian from Obsidian Butte has been dated as a marker for the late prehistoric, and it is believed to have erupted around 940 BC. So they were able to tell that the obsidian was created in, a, in an explosive event due to a volcanic explosion. And the age of the obsidian butte has been a source of controversy for a while. Artifacts created from the obsidian from Obsidian Butte first appear in Native American villages around 510 to 640 BC, but for a long time geologists were insisting that the butte was geologically young and only created 30,000 years ago. And it was only a few years ago that geologists finally changed that because of some new evidence and um, now they date it to around the eruption to around 940 BC which better lines up with the uh, archaeology. So it is an important geothermal site, and there are around 10 geothermal power plants in the area. There are also oil drills and constant fracking being done in the area. There is farming, and the air is thick with pollution. It smells bad, and it, it's, it almost burns your eyes and throat, and it's just dirty. It's grainy. The air is, is grainy with particles or something. Um, and people have even accused the fracking as being the cause of earthquake swarms in the area. They're, yeah, they're called earthquake swarms, and you can all, you know, it's just like it sounds. So I loved my trip to Obsidian Butte, but let's face it, there is a reason it's not much of a tourist attraction, even though it's actually quite a marvel. Um, some other information I learned about it were, was that there's at least five geothermal fields, and I also read that at least four separate aeromagnetic geo aeromagnetic anomalies that may be the sign of a bear, of buried volcanoes. And one of the geothermal fields includes the Sierra, the Cerro Prieto volcano, which is in Baja, Mexico. Well, I guess they don't call it Baja, Mexico. It's in Mexico. And it is really an impressive volcano because of this gigantic reptilian bird creature carved on the top of it, which must be absolutely huge. And I did my best to, and I dug deep to find research, um, to research like who made this bird and find any kind of archaeology on the area. But as far as that goes, everything I could find about the area, the Cerro Prieto volcano in English is all about the ge geothermal, geo, geo, geological information about it. I couldn't find any archaeological information about it in English. So I guess if you want to learn about it, you have to find some, be able to read, read it in Spanish. But it's a very curious location. I just think it's so interesting and I would like to know more. But anyways, Obsidian Butte um, is also highly active seismic zone. There is a lot going on underground in this area, and the gases released in an earthquake could potentially be deadly, and I'm sure they contribute to the smells coming from the sea that can often be smelled as far away as Los Angeles. It's usually in the summer 
that it's the worst. And also, you know, I'm sure that the massive amounts of dead birds and fish on all sides surrounding the sea, all the carcasses probably contribute to that as well. And who knows how deep it is, how deep the bones are. So anyways, having so many fault lines has created geothermal activity around the Salton Sea and many places along the Salton Sea on my Salton Sea to go list. Like there's mud pots, both new and old, where warm mud is bubbling to the surface from some unseen force below. There are places with natural hot springs. There's a mud geyser that shoots mud out of the ground. There's sand circles that are just like crop circles, but made in the sand. Um, and then there's Dos Palmas, which is the greatest source for surface water located on the east side. And that water is available year round. It's also the most likely spot where if there are Bigfoot living in the area, you would be most likely to find them there because, you know, they're going to go where the water is just like all the animal life in the area. So I do plan to go to this location and look for prints in the mud. And of course, um, as always, I'll be looking for toe prints. So, you know, even though these summers are a bit intolerable, there are also many cave systems and places that are inaccessible to hu by humans. So environmentally, surprisingly, this desert habitation actually meets a lot of the criteria for a Bigfoot habitation. What I see as criteria for Bigfoot habitation is our water, um, wild areas away from humans, and underground access, and if there's other wildlife and predators and prey in the area, that's also a sign that they could potentially survive as well. So Anza Borrego Desert is at the southwest end of the sea, and there's many legends of the Borrego Sandman coming from the area. And the Borrego Sandman would be the Southern California equivalent to his taller cousin up north in Northern California. So they're reported to be stockier, shorter, and adept at, to living in an environment, a desert environment. And so, you know, around here, when water is scarce, any fresh water sources become likely hotspots for Bigfoot. So, um, and then you have the Joshua tree that starts on the northeast end of the sea, and that's home to the legendary Yucca Man. And the Yucca Man is named for being seen in the nearby area called Yucca Valley, bordering Joshua Tree and Morongo Valley and the Morongo Preserve, which is another source for fresh water year round. So there's possibilities that um, Bigfoot exist here. And surprisingly, even though it's hot as hell out here, the desert has fresh water um, existing in underground aquifers and then in Hemet as an underground river and cave system. So I always am looking for wildlife and trying to take pictures of absolutely anything that I can see in the area. And I was really excited to see so many burrowing owls. They are endangered. So if you ever see one, please be kind and just realize we've taken so much of their habitat away. Um, they live in burrowing underground areas and so it's very challenging for them to find safe places to live. Every owl life is important, especially when they're endangered. So if you see any owls, just give them as much space as you can. And it's also illegal to kill owls. Okay. And then, so in many of my videos, I noticed these large black things flying around and getting really close to me. And they're so fast, I can barely even find the frames that they're in. And of course, my first thought was UFO, but looking closer, I can see wings. So they're not UFOs. And so, of course, I'm thinking just big, big bugs. There's definitely lots of bugs around there. But it was just really strange because I didn't see or notice these big bugs at all. And so I'm 
going to suggest that maybe they weren't bugs at all. They aren't bugs, but maybe something more stealthy, maybe something like bats. And the I have some other reasons for suspecting that they could be bats. For one, I didn't hear or see or notice anything, and they kept getting really close in the pictures I noticed, and they look very large. And um, nearby, there's a place called the Bat Caves that's at the southeast end of the sea, and there's a lot of bats in the area. And now I think this is, I'm going to talk about my two bat experiences that I've had here in the desert. So bats have a strange way of seeing the world through sonar. They are really intelligent and curious. And if they want to take a good look at you, they're going to do it in their own unique way. And it doesn't involve vision with eyes as we know it. And these are things I learned on my own from my, the, my own personal bat ex- encounters. So the first encounter happened, I was with my friend and um, she is 100% rock hound. And often um, we go to these places with abandoned mines and they're usually very far remote and going to be really, really hot. And um, she likes to stay, you know, till it's dark. So I'm a rock hound too, but we, I always make this deal with her that I will go, um, if we, as long as we can arrive to the location when it's still dark outside before the sun comes up. So it won't be so hot. And the real reason I do that, want to do that is to look for UFOs. And she knows that, but I just, you know, I always word it like, you know, whatever. But so we, you know, that's kind of the deal that we always make. I'll, go to these distant places, but we leave, you know, when it's still dark outside so that we can have a little bit of time there in the dark to look for UFOs. And uh, so we were doing this and we were by one of the palm oasises at night and it was a pitch black night. We're standing outside of the car and sometimes it's too scary to even get out of the car. But anyways, I'm using my flash to take, um, orb pictures and eye shine pictures and look for UFOs. And um, so I take a picture with a flash. And when I did, I just happened to look at her. And for the instant when the flash went off, she was lit up. And I saw what looked like a swarm of bats completely engulfing her body from behind, all around and above like centimeters away from her skin, but totally out of her sight. And after that second of two of light, when it went back to pitch blackness, I felt my stomach drop and I was so scared. And I just was told her, let's get out of here. Let's go now. Hurry. And we got back in the car and, um, you know, after it was all over, I'm like, did I really see that? You know, cause I have a vivid imagination and it was just a couple seconds. You know, if I was really smart, I would have just told her to hold still and I would have taken some pictures of her with the flash, but I was thinking of safety or something and I didn't do that. Next time I will make her hold still. But anyway, so that was the first thing that happened. And the next thing that happened, happened not long after I moved here and I was walking, I was taking the trash out one night and walking along the side of the house that is lightly colored and it was lit up um, by the street light and I could see my shadow and it was real dark and big and I was along the wall and then I saw this other shadow come up behind me of what I think was a gigantic bat. And with its wingspan, it was like bigger than my head. And um, it did the same thing to me that that swarm did to my friend. It like wrapped around me from behind, super close without touching me, and like went up my body to my head and then went away. Like maybe it was using its body to trace the shape of mine as a way of seeing me using sonar maybe. Um, it's it's They seem to know though to stay behind you. And it was so stealthy, I didn't hear, see, or feel anything. 
And if not for seeing its shadow, I never would have had any idea that something was that close to me. And obviously, it came up to me um, from behind like that. It was checking me out. So um, I think that was a bad. And then I also have this photo that I took from my jacuzzi. And oftentimes, I... Um, I'll just take or pictures using the flash and that's what I was doing. And I just happened to get this bat in the photo, which is pretty cool. So I only picked up like around 10 pieces of obsidian. I didn't take really hardly anything, um, but we were driving and all of a sudden I yelled stop. And I ran over to this area because I just imagined someone sitting there and um, carving um, arrowheads with the obsidian. And so I picked up the pieces that were lying around there. And these are them. And they definitely look man-made. And I'm pretty amazed that I found them because just the area is really big. It's definitely been glazed, you know, seen by people. And so there's not like... I didn't really see like a bunch of artifacts and stuff lying around or anything like that. So I felt fortunate to just have gotten these pieces and the obsidian is so amazing. Like it gets, it's so razor sharp because of just how thin it gets. Like this one arrow just thins smoothly down into absolutely nothing. It's amazing. So I would love to go back to Obsidian Butte, but before I do, I will probably be going to all the other places on my Salton Sea to-do list and continuing on with my Salton Sea explorations. So if you like this video and you want to see more, please subscribe and like. Thanks for watching. Bye.